It is no secret that Egypt is the birthplace of a variety of mysteries and numerous myths about the past and world's beginnings. The oldest known monumental sculpture of the Middle Eastern nation is the mythical Egyptian limestone structure, which depicts a fictitious, sprawling sphinx. There are several sphinxes, but only the Great Sphinx of Giza is known to have held as many secrets. According to rumors, researchers have discovered a new hidden room beneath the Sphinx, which was built almost 4,500 years ago. And this piques the interest of the tech billionaire Elon Musk. Egypt has extended an invitation to billionaire Elon Musk to travel there and verify that the world-famous pyramids were not constructed by extraterrestrials. The CEO of SpaceX had posted what appeared to be encouragement for those who believe aliens were engaged in the gigantic construction project. Join me as we unravel this legendary structure and how the archaeologists were stunned when they unearthed secret tunnels and chambers beneath the enormous Giza Sphinx today. And will it prove Elon Musk's claim that this has an alien origin? Let's find out. Hello everyone, welcome back to Elon Musk Evolution, where we bring you the most recent news about Elon Musk and his multi-billion dollar companies, space news, and the latest science and technology. But before we begin, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so you don't miss any of our amazing videos. You would surely mention Egypt's magnificent pyramids if someone asked you what it was renowned for. But in this arid nation, there is another place that dominates travelers' itineraries. That is the Great Sphinx of Giza. The Great Sphinx of Giza is a massive limestone statue of a recumbent sphinx that is situated in Giza. It is one of the most well-known specimens of Sphinx art and one of the largest sculptures in the entire world. But there are still many unanswered questions around the creation of the site, like why, when, and how. Let's examine the controversies and mysteries surrounding this sculpture. One of the masterpieces created by ancient Egyptian culture is the statue of the Great Sphinx. The impressive statue is still standing after many years. It is regarded as a testament to the excellence of the ancient Egyptians and the growth of their thoughts and skills that enabled them to create this masterpiece. The Sphinx's origin and whether or not it represents a human personality who lived in the time of the ancient Egyptians are topics that a lot of people are unaware of. Most academics concur that the Sphinx's origins are in the fourth dynasty and that King Khafre's reign is when it first appeared. Other researchers contend that it was constructed by Khafre's elder brother, Jijifre, to honor their paternal grandfather, Khufu, whose Giza pyramid is widely known as the Great Pyramid of Cheops due to its enormous size. According to advocates of this theory, Khafre is more like Khufu than Khafre in the face of the Great Sphinx. It has also been suggested that Khufu actually constructed the statue in light of this observation. Over time, the Sphinx's form has undergone a significant transformation. Numerous attempts have been attempted to maintain the statue since ancient times, perhaps starting during the reign of Thutmose IV, when the body is most vulnerable to wear. The nose is conspicuously missing from the face, which has obviously been disfigured. Some claim that the Sphinx's nose was shot with a cannon by Napoleon's forces. The Sphinx did not have a nose, nevertheless, as seen in drawings from before Napoleon. Encyclopedia Britannica has a different theory that claims the Sufi Muhammad Siam al-Dar vandalized the statue in the 14th century to protest idolatry. The Sphinx was designed to resemble a legendary animal with a lion's body and a human head. It stands for a significant figure in Greek and Egyptian mythology and art. Greek grammarians created the word Sphinx from the verb sphingine, but the derivation has nothing to do with myth. Hesiod, an early Greek writer, referred to him as Phyx. One of the biggest monuments in the world, the Great Sphinx is 73 meters in width and 20 meters in length. The Great Sphinx at Giza is known to have a number of shafts or tunnels within or below its main body. The little square lid of the shaft is thought to have been excavated by treasure hunters in antiquity. Known shaft locations include two on the Sphinx's flanks and one at the top of its head, for a total of at least three. Excavations beneath the main body of the Sphinx at Giza were undertaken in 1998 by Zahi Hawass, chief director of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, which led to the rediscovery of access tunnels to many sizable, seemingly natural caves. Ancient digs from the past were also discovered. Known shafts and holes. Four feet behind the head, on the back of the Sphinx, lies a hole. 
Pairings Hole, named after his engineer, is a construction project by Howard Weiss from the 1840s. Weiss dug a 27-foot deep hole in search of chambers, but the drill rod got caught. To avoid harming the Sphinx any further, he made an attempt to remove the rod using gunpowder but gave up. Zahi Hawass discovered a piece of the Sphinx's headdress inside the cavity Weiss had left when he cleaned it out in 1978. Eastern Shaft Between the Thutmos IV Dream Steel and the Sphinx's chest is a trapdoor made of iron that is fixed to the ground inside of its paws. As part of his restoration work in the 1920s, Barres filled the opening, which is not a corridor, but rather a roughly rectangular hole with a cement roof, an iron beam, and then sealed it with a trap door. Shaft A This large hole, Shaft A, on the top of the Sphinx's skull, was likewise cemented over by Barres. The pit is roughly six feet deep and about five feet square. The hole's mouth was covered with an iron trap door. According to one theory, the hole was originally made to attach a headpiece on the Sphinx in the New Kingdom style, but it was later deepened in an effort to find hidden rooms. A worker can be seen standing inside the Giza Sphinx's head hole in an image shot during Emile Barres's excavations in 1925 CE. Vivan Dinon etched a picture of the Sphinx somewhere about 1798, albeit he didn't exactly copy it. He had drawn a picture of a man being dragged out, so it's likely that he was aware that the top of its head had a hole. Shaft C on the back of the enormous Giza Sphinx lies Shaft C. It has a dead end and a square shaft. Shaft D. This shaft, which is located on the floor in the northwest back half of the Sphinx, was first made public in 1980 by Zahi Hawass and Mark Lehner. Mohammed Abdi al Magud Fayed, an engineer for the Antiquity Service who had assisted Emile Barres in removing the Sphinx in 1926 as a young man, was the one who first reported this. The water table is below the Sphinx and can be reached via this route. A dead end is reached about 4.5 meters below floor level in one section of the passage that descends beneath the Sphinx. In the upward curve of the rump, shaft D in the northwest passage would be an open trench if it weren't for the layers of old restoration stones that have been placed on top of it. The debris slightly above this point comprised contemporary materials like glass, cement, tinfoil, etc. It was discovered in 1980 that the bottom half did in fact reach the water table. There are footholds in the shape of cups along the walls of the roughly cut corridor, whose sides are not straight. It appears to be an exploration shaft. Keyhole Shaft The shaft D is another well-known hollow that is located in the Giza Sphinx enclosure but is not related to the Sphinx itself. In the enclosure's floor, beneath the north ledge of the wall, just across from the north hind paw, lies the so-called keyhole shaft. A little more than six feet deep, the passage is roughly 4.5 by 3.5 feet. Inside the shaft was a sizable piece of basalt with one side smoothed out. Perhaps the corridor was intended to be a tomb, but it was never finished. According to legend, the Great Sphinx at the Giza Pyramid Complex has a library called the Hall of Records buried beneath it. Similar to how the Great Library of Alexandria held Greek information, it is said to contain the wisdom of the Egyptians on papyrus scrolls. Although there is some disagreement as to whether the hall genuinely exists, all excavation in the region has so far produced few or no results. In 1980, Lehner hired Tom Egner, a young German geologist who had an innovative idea for demonstrating how the Sphinx was an essential component of Khafre's greater architectural complex. Over tens of millions of years, mud, coral, and the shells of organisms like plankton are squeezed together to form limestone. Egner and Lehner made an inventory of the various fossils that make up the limestone by examining samples from the Sphinx temple and the Sphinx itself. The blocks that were used to construct the temple's wall must have come from the ditch surrounding the Sphinx, according to the fossil fingerprints. The Sphinx was reportedly being carved out of the stone when workers pulled away the quarry blocks needed to build the temple most likely using ropes and wooden sledges. More and more evidence points to Khafre having orchestrated the building of his pyramid, the temples, and the Sphinx. Hawass stated that the majority of scholars believe, as I do, in his 2006 book, Mountain of the Pharaohs, that the Sphinx represents Khafre and forms an integral part of his pyramid complex. Nevertheless, who was responsible for the Sphinx's laborious construction? An American tourist was thrown from her horse 
in the 1990 desert ride when it stumbled on a low mud brick wall, which was located half a mile south of the Sphinx. A cemetery from the Old Kingdom was found after Hawass's investigation. There were graves for 600 persons, some of whom were overseers, whose tombs were surrounded by the more modest graves of common laborers and marked with inscriptions containing their names and titles. Nine years later, Lehner found his lost city close to the graveyard. He and Hawass have known there were structures there since the middle of the 1980s. However, they didn't discover it was a village larger than 10 football fields old and dated to Khafre's reign until they dug up and studied the area. Four groups of eight lengthy mud brick barracks made up its center. Each building had a pillared portico, sleeping platforms, and a kitchen that had been extended to fit about 50 people sleeping side by side. According to Lehner, the barracks could have held 1,600 to 2,000 workers, or perhaps more, if the sleeping accommodations were on two levels. The food of the employees suggests they were not slaves. Prime beef was discovered by Lehner's team in the form of predominantly male cattle that were under two years old. According to Lehner, ordinary Egyptians may have joined and left the work crew on a rotating basis, as part of a national service or feudal duty to their superiors. Lehner and Rick Brown, a professor of sculpture at the Massachusetts College of Art, worked on replicas of ancient tools found on the Giza Plateau and depicted in tomb paintings this past fall, as part of a Nova documentary project in an effort to learn more about the construction of the Sphinx. They sculpted a scaled-down version of the missing nose of the Sphinx from a limestone block. The Egyptians had no access to iron or bronze tools 45 millennia ago. In addition to copper chisels for finely finished work, they mostly used stone hammers. With the help of art students, Brown bashed away in the yard of his studio in Boston and discovered that the copper chisels went blunt after just a few strikes and needed to be resharpened in a forge he built out of a charcoal furnace. As reported by Lehner and Brown, one worker could carve a cubic foot of stone in a week. According to estimates, 100 individuals would need three years to finish building the Sphinx at such a rate. Lehner has thoughts about that as well, some of which are founded in part on his work at the Sphinx Temple. It is unclear exactly what Khafre wanted the Sphinx to do for him or his country. In front of the Sphinx, you can still see the remains of the temple walls. They encircle a courtyard that is surrounded by 24 pillars. A pair of modest niches or sanctuaries, each about the size of a closet, serve as clear markers of the temple plan's east-west axis. An east-west line points to where the sun rises and sets twice a year during the equinoxes, halfway between midsummer and midwinter. Herbert Rickey, a Swiss archaeologist who investigated the temple in the late 1960s, came to the conclusion that the axis mirrored the movements of the sun. In addition, Rickey contended that each pillar stood for a single hour in the sun's daily cycle. Lehner noticed something that might be even more amazing, a remarkable astronomical occurrence can be observed at the March or September equinoxes if you are standing in the eastern niche around sunset. The sun appears to sink into the shoulder of the Sphinx and then into the south side of the Pyramid of Khafre on the horizon. The shadows of the Sphinx and the pyramid, two symbols of the ruler, become merged silhouettes at the very same instant, according to Lehner. Hawass agrees, saying the Sphinx represents Khafre as Horus, the Egyptians' revered royal falcon god, who is giving offerings with his two paws to his father, Khufu, who is incarnated as the sun god Ra, who rises and sets in that temple. The Sphinx itself appears to have symbolized the pharaoh presenting offerings to the sun god in the court of the temple. The sun appears to set halfway between the outlines of the pyramids of Khafre and Khufu when one is standing close to the Sphinx on the summer solstice, which is another fascinating discovery made by Lehner. The image is reminiscent of the hieroglyph Akhet, which means horizon in English, but also represents the cycle of life and rebirth. Lehner noted in the Archive of Oriental Research, even by coincidence, it is impossible to picture the Egyptians not noticing this ideogram. If done on purpose, it rates as a significant, if not the most significant, instance of architectural illusionism. If Lehner and Hawass are correct, Khafre's architects plan for solar events to connect the pyramid, sphinx, and temple. As a whole, according to Lehner, the complex served as a cosmic engine that was designed to use the strength of the sun and other gods to revive the pharaoh's spirit. In addition to ensuring the dead ruler's eternal life, this transformation also preserved the natural world's overall order, including the change of the seasons, 
the annual flooding of the Nile, and people's day-to-day -day existence. The Sphinx may have represented a variety of things in this holy cycle of death and rebirth, including the Guardian of the Afterlife and the Giza tombs. The Sun Deity manifested in the live King Khafre and a representation of the deceased monarch. However, it appears that Khafre's plan was never fully implemented. The Sphinx shows symptoms of incompleteness. Three stone blocks that had been left behind while workers were dragging them to construct the Sphinx temple were discovered by Hawass and Lehner in 1978 in a remote area of the statue's quarry. Bedrock fragments that have only been partially quarried can be found around the north edge of the canal that surrounds the Sphinx. The archaeologists also discovered stone hammers and beer or water jar fragments here, along with the remains of a workman's lunch and toolkit. It appears that the builders left their work. Lehner is fond of claiming that nobody turned the key and switched it on and that by the time the Old Kingdom ultimately fell apart around 2130 BC, the desert sands had started to reclaim the Sphinx. The young royal it spoke to would go unnoticed for the following seven centuries. The Egyptian prince Thutmose went on a hunting expedition in the desert, felt weary, and took a nap in the shade of the Sphinx, according to the legend engraved on a pink granite block between the Sphinx's paws. The statue addressed him in a dream and went by the name Hori Maket, which is also known as Horus in the Horizon or Horus in the Horizon. It bemoaned the sand's encroachment and its decomposed body. The throne was then offered to Thutmose in exchange for assistance by Hori Maket. It is unknown if the prince truly had this dream, but when he rose to power as Pharaoh Thutmose IV, he assisted in bringing a cult that revered the Sphinx to the new kingdom. In sculptures, reliefs, and paintings all over Egypt, Sphinxes were frequently shown as a forceful representation of royalty and the sacrosanct power of the sun. The oldest slabs, according to Lehner's research of the numerous layers of stone slabs laid like tile work over the Sphinx's deteriorating surface, may be as old as 3,400 years to Thutmose's time. According to the Horimaket tale, Thutmose may have led the initial effort to restore the Sphinx. Lehner spread one of his many maps of the Sphinx out on a table when he was in the U.S. He added that in the early decades after it was constructed, the Sphinx had suffered damage from the weather. He showed where an old trench had cut into the statue. Limestone deteriorates as a result of the porous rock absorbing moisture. What was the source of so much rain in the allegedly parched desert of Giza, which presented additional mystery to Lehner? What do you think of the marvelous structures of Egypt? Do you agree with Elon Musk that these are the works of an advanced alien civilization that resides on Earth? Let us know your thoughts in the comment box below. And that ends today's episode. What do you think of this episode? Please subscribe and don't forget to like today's video. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.